Faxi's Musical Podcast. Hey everybody, welcome back to Baxi's Musical Podcast. In 1977, punk rock was all the rage in the UK. But if you didn't spike your hair or have safety pins in your face or hork up gobs of spit at your favorite band while they played live, then you just weren't fitting in. By all accounts, England was crawling with young upstarts who were beginning bands without the burden of having to learn music theory or devote hours to expensive lessons. All you had to do was steal a guitar, learn a chord or two, and find something to plug into, and then suddenly you're ready to join a band. But among those legions of punk rock bands, there were some that actually showed a good deal of promise. And in 1977, one of those bands was a band called Satan's Rats. Now, you might not know much about the Rats, but in 1977, they had built up a big enough following to open for the Sex Pistols, not once, but a bunch of times, released a fistful of singles, and then they would break up. Then they would hire a new lead singer in Wendy Wu, and then they would become the band The Photos. Now the story starts to get a little more interesting, because in 1980, The Photos released their first album on a major label, in this case Epic Records, and based upon a few well-received singles, the album zoomed up to number four on the UK charts. And when they recorded their second album, which was then produced by David Bowie's producer Tony Visconti, that's when things fell apart again. Fast forward a few decades, and Satan's Rats are back, this time with three of the original members, including Steve Eagles, Ollie Harrison, and Dave Sparrow, plus a new lead singer, the aptly named Puss Johnson. They also updated things with a new name, Satan's Cats. The band has just released an excellent EP in which they have re-recorded some of their best songs from 1977, and honestly, it's not only very well done, it's an absolute blast to listen to. Here's my interview with lead guitarist and vocalist for Satan's Rats, Cats, and The Photos. It's Steve Eagles on Baxi's Musical Podcast. Hi, Baxi. Hey, how are you? I'm well. Good to have you here, though. I appreciate you you taking the time. No, it's a pleasure, man. I got to tell you, I got the, uh, I got the EP uh, last week. And I've been listening to it a lot over the last couple of days. This had to be so much fun to put together. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah, um, a- absolutely. I mean, to bring the you know the old guys back and uh, with the, with some new blood in there, this had to be a lot of fun to go back and and listen to these songs and say, yeah, let's do those again. Yeah, well, that came about uh, by Ollie, the drummer, who suggested, and he was in lockdown, and. Uh, he sent me an email and he said, wouldn't it be good to get Puss to do some vocals on some old Rats tracks? And I kind of thought, well, maybe, maybe not, you know, Um, because I haven't really listened to those tracks for a long time. Uh, And I'm a guitar teacher, that's what I do. And one of my students asked if we could do some old Satan's Rats songs. So uh, I said, okay. And uh, we put these <laughs> tunes on and played through them. I, th- I thought, Jesus, these are great. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I sent Ollie an email. I said, yeah, why not? Let's do it. And that was about a year later. Listening to the EP and then going back, listening to the old songs, and then uh, spending some time listening to, uh, to Puss Johnson. I have to say that other than Rat Scabies and Buster Blood Vessel, I think Puss Johnson may have the best stage name I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's... I think that's fantastic. And then to find out she comes from the band Pussycat and the Dirty Johnsons, that's like frickin' poetry. It just rolls right off the tongue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> How did you guys come to uh, to contact her? Well, uh, Puss and Ollie are an item. They've been together for a while now, you know. And uh, Ollie even had to uh, take over on drums for, for one of the UK tours that the Dirty Johnsons did because the, <laughs> the drummer had like, injured himself or something mm. and Ollie had to <clears throat> learn all the songs and, and do a UK tour. It, it was a bit of a shock to the system for Ollie, but uh, I think he, he enjoyed himself, you know, because he played drums for a long time. 
when you guys got back to playing these songs again, and, and you know, you're talking about remakes of You Make Me Sick and Facade and Sex Object and, and, uh, and Year of the Rat, when you guys get back to playing these things uh, after a period of time of not, like you said, not really thinking even a, a, about these songs, I mean, what was it like the first time you guys are playing uh, you, you together again? And, and did, it, did, it, did it sound and feel right to you? Well, it was kind of weird because uh, we agreed to meet in this town called Basingstoke, which is uh, where Puss lives. And uh, it's not so far from London. Ollie lives in London. And me and Dave, the bass player, we, we live in this little town called Evesham, which is about 100 miles away or something. And so we, we drove down to this little rehearsal room in Basingstoke. And um, we'd done our homework on the songs. And then we got in this room and, um, and we started playing the songs and they sounded, they sounded tight and everything. But they were all in the wrong key for Puss's <laughs> vocal. So the hardest thing was just trying to transpose everything into a different key. Uh, it was like a tone and a half difference mm. from the original recordings. Um, but once we did that, you know, she was on it. She is a quality singer. No, there's there's no question about it. She 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 crushes those songs. And actually, one that was kind of a surprise that you did was uh, the rocker, uh, the old Thin Lizzy song. Thin Lizzy is not a band that gets an overwhelming amount of attention here in the states, and it, but they were you know different. They were perceived very differently in the UK, obviously, you know, being from from Ireland. But uh, yeah, she crushes every song. She's she's really a good singer. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was another one. Ollie said, "Can we try? Can we try the rocker?" And uh, on the drive, on the drive up there, me and Dave said, "That ain't going to work." <laughs> <laughs> and we played it, and she nailed it. Yeah. I mean, she owned it. You know, it was amazing. To go back to these these songs that you guys you know had written back in '77 or you know '78 or however far back uh, you know some of these songs go, I mean, you guys started Satan's Rats. In, in early 1977, and you were literally like, I think the average age of all four of you were like 17 years old. You couldn't get into clubs at 17 years old here in the States. So what, what was it like to be, you know, in that moment, 1976, 77, when, when punk is really starting to explode in the UK? As a 17-year-old kid, what, what was that like for you guys? It was fun, and we knew that if you put a band together, there were gigs there. I mean, there were so many gigs in the UK at the time. Clubs that had never, ever, I mean, like disco clubs, mm. talking about. And then all of a sudden, they're actually putting punk bands on uh, all over the place. And also, you, you had a chance of uh, getting a record deal. Every single label seemed to want a punk band on their, on their books. And, but apart from all that, it just seemed exciting, you know. I mean, we just read about it in the music press, you know, the, the, the melody maker, the new musical express and sounds, and they all covered the, the beginnings of punk. And just reading about it was exciting. And um, because, uh, because I'd, been, I'd played guitar for a few years, I said to my friend Paul, we're at, college in Evesham I said I'm going to form a band do you want to sing and he said well I don't know whether I can sing and I said I know you can sing you know <laughs> I kind of forced him into it well, that wasn't uh, really that wasn't really a prerequisite for a lot of bands either <laughs> the, the ability wasn't necessarily what got you in or out of a band oh well it was just an attitude you know right you just went for it you know and uh I found a drummer and a, and a bass player and uh, we started to rehearse. And after maybe a week or two, two maximum, uh, I booked all these village halls around where we live because I couldn't think of anywhere else to play. So we did a little tour of the village halls. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then from there, we, uh, I remember we went to a Stranglers gig in, in Birmingham, a club called Barbarella's. And at the end of the gig, the DJ announced that the following week there would be Birmingham's first punk festival. Mm. And 
if any bands wanted to play, just come up and see him at the, in the DJ booth, and he would put us on. <laughs> so there we were, a week later, you know, playing at Barbarella's. So the 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 sense that you know that that you read about was that there were a, a million bands you know springing up all over the place back then, but the scene in different pockets around the UK was relatively small. But at at that point, when you're getting gigs and you're playing these these smaller halls, as the Sex Pistols are you know, burning bridges everywhere, and there are suddenly it's hard for them to get gigs, or you know, intentionally. They uh, were were unable to play anywhere. Did you find that there was like residual effects of what they were going through on other punk bands? What you mean in terms of them being banned? Uh, Them being them being banned, and you know the 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 filth and the fury, the the old uh, you know the Bill Grundy situation. In in some ways, it it may have helped them, uh, but in other ways, it may have hurt other people. Well, I I can tell you that because of our name, we there are. Some promoters didn't book us. We had an agent, you know, that was, was getting us gigs all around the UK. And he said, uh, your, your name is a problem. People think that you're going to be some kind of violent, you know, biker gang or something like that. <laughs> and we were just kids, you know, with, yeah. with, a, with a daft name. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, you guys were building a following. You get, guys were getting better and, and getting better gigs. And then suddenly you find yourself opening up for the Sex Pistols at the, the Roxy and the, the, the Marquee Club. What was it like to, to be opening for them with, uh, with everything going on back in, in 77? Well, that gig came about because the, our agent booked us in in some northern club in Doncaster or somewhere. And it got cancelled at the last minute. So we didn't have, we didn't do this particular show. And then a week later, he contacted uh, our manager and said, you know, I blew this gig out at the last minute, but maybe this will make up for it. He said, um, I've got your band to open for the Sex Pistols in Wolverhampton at this place called the Lafayette Club. And, and that's how we got it. And it was a, a secret gig, and we were told that we had to get in there at midday, and we couldn't leave the club. <laughs> uh, we had to stay in there all day with with the pistols, which was which was fun. What uh, what was your impression of them back then? Well, kind of cartoon characters, you know. <laughs> um, Did you get a chance to see uh, the that docu series about the Sex Pistols? Pistol, the one about Steve Jones. Yes. I saw it. What was your thoughts about that? I loved it. Yeah. I've, I've, I've it. talked to a number of people who you who had seen it and, and, you know, were kind of, you know, in the scene, you know, jaw wobble and some you know, other people. And they, and they kind of all feel the same way that, you know, the first couple of episodes in particular really kind of captured the mood of what was going on back then. And certainly, you know, the mood around that band, you talk about them being kind of cartoon characters. I think... That's certainly impre- the impression you get from that series, but it, it sounds like that was kind of what they were and, and, and who they were at that at that time. And, and, and playing with them, I'm sure, I'm sure you must have seen a, a good deal of that. Yeah, um, because you read about them in the press and you, you, you saw their interviews or read their interviews and you saw them on, on the telly and, uh, and they lived up to it. You know, they were cartoon characters. It was like... When we we met the Ramones once, we shared some dressing rooms with the, with the Ramones. They were cartoon characters. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they were. Yes, they were. <laughs> so you know, it was. Uh, we weren't disappointed. Put it like that. I bet you guys uh, would release a, a couple of singles back then, and uh, for whatever reason, some of the songs that are even on this EP. Bob Geldof reviewed in the NME and he kind of, kind of crapped all over you guys. Is, uh, did you ever get a chance to confront him about that, about what the problem was? Cause as I'm listening Listen, to the, was, as I'm listening to the originals, I don't see anything wrong with them. This is the music press in the UK in those days, they ruled everything. And, right. uh, it was, you knew that if you really released anything, you could easily get a hammering in the review section or if they came to a gig that they could easily give you a hammering, you know, 
uh, it, it just depended on the reviewer and they had ultimate power. So, you know, when people like Bob Geldof was given the singles to review that week, you know, you knew he was going to trash most of it. He even, he even suggested that we ripped off the intro from the Rolling Stones. That's what he said in his review. <laughs> well, didn't every band in 1970 rip off the intros for the Rolling Stones? Was that would that would have been? <laughs> I mean, if you're gonna rip somebody off, let it be the Stones. Yeah, well, I mean, but we didn't. You know, it's just a. Oh, I know, I know. You guys eventually ended the as the as Satan's Rats, and then became the Photos, which I didn't realize when I when I was first researching the band that the that you guys had been part of the Photos, and I, and I actually remember that record uh and being a great one and i know that you know you guys get signed to a major label with epic and, and you release that album and in the uk it did very very well but i remember irene and i'm so attractive and uh that was just a great great band well i mean we the satan's rats lineup was together for at least two years uh and paul the singer left and we just thought he was a a chance to do something you know a little bit different we decided we wanted a female singer maybe it's because we were blondie fans which we were but we were, we were ramones fans we were stranglers fans we were pistols fans uh, we were clash fans you know we just liked <clears throat> what was out there but um and I, I i thought that getting a female singer would appeal to my songwriting you know was beginning to develop a bit more at that point. And the three of us, we were tight, you know, as a band, we were tight. So all we had to do was get a singer in. Uh, we had some songs already written up, then we write a few more. And uh, we realised that we had a real commercial edge. And uh, Wendy, Wendy sounded fantastic and she had a different sounding voice. Some of those songs, and in particular, like Irene, and I'm so attractive. I mean, it's a, it's a major leap from what the Rats were doing, you know, from a songwriting level. I mean, there was, I mean, harmonies and and just the the structure of those songs. Those are just great pop songs. So, I mean, that's a pretty quick, you know, leap of maturity in in your music writing. I guess so, um, but <laughs> we just got off on you know going into uh, the room where we used to rehearse and. And coming out at the end of it with a with a what we thought sounded like a top thirty single or something, and when you, you get that buzz, you carry on doing it. You know, it's it's intoxicating, really. You guys uh, tried to release a second album, Crystal Tips and uh, and uh, Mighty Mice, and and I know there's a story about it that it was just released as a uh, in a as you know promotionally, but it it never hit retail stores. What what was the story with that? with that record? Cause it, I mean, it took like 27 years before, uh, I think it was a red cherry records finally released it. What, what, what was the story on that record? Well, the story was that we recorded this album with Tony Visconti. We had a fantastic time recording it and we came out the other end with what we considered to be a, a great album. And, uh, a load of people, you know, the higher ups from CBS came down to listen to the, tracks you know the playback and declared it as you know a great album and we thought everything is fine but then um muff winwood our a and r guy said i want you to go away and write a couple of top 30s i said what are you talking about he said <laughs> he said uh, i just want some uh, I, he said, I don't hear any. I, I, he said, I think it's a great album, but I, I don't hear any hit singles on it, apart from this one track, which I think is a number one. I, my head was spinning. I, I just didn't know what to say to him. Uh, and he, he refused to release the album until we had the top 30 singles. That's amazing to me, because you know, Muff Winwood has you know produced great records so did i mean tony visconti back in 1981 82 or whenever this was i mean that guy was like producing you know major records back then with you know bowie and and everybody else it would seem that anything that guy touched you just put out absolutely and uh tony was so angry about this he said i'm never gonna have anything to do with cbs or epic or anything 
he was really upset. And uh, and it was like a really must have been a bad chapter in his career. Because yeah. I'm sure nothing like that had ever happened to him before. So 27 years later, the uh, the album finally gets released. How how did how did that come to happen? I mean, you had for like you know, the next two and a half decades. You I mean you're probably just sitting there wishing this thing could come out. But how did it finally make its way into uh, into stores? Because <laughs> I emailed Cherry Red, and I'd already got them to release the first album, you know, on a CD years later. And I said, look, there's this second album in, in some vault somewhere. And they tried to get it out of CBS and then it failed. And then I urged them to have another go, which they did. And then they had some success and the tapes were released. And then they had to be, have you heard about tapes being baked? Yeah. 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 They had to do that with, 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 with the masters. And then uh, I had some, a co- collaboration with this guy, uh, and he put all the sleeve notes together, and we, you know, we just put the package together, just by email. Really, we didn't even meet up. And uh, Cherry Red finally released it on CD, and it, it sounded great. But did you say 27 years? Uh, that's I, Yeah, that's that's what I counted, 27 yeah, years. Yeah, yeah, but it came out 27 years too late, didn't it? Yeah, but still, it's just it's just interesting to me how a record company or an executive can come down to a studio, listen to this piece of work that everyone's excited about, and for whatever reason, hold it up on a whim. And, and that's just, that's, I know that it's not, you're, that's not the only time that's happened in music history. But it's uh, it, it's it's remarkable when it happens, and you hear these stories about how much great music probably got you know destroyed and forgot about for that very reason. I know. Um, I mean, we had a nickname for Muffin Wood. It was Duff Dimwood, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> he deserved to have a nickname like that. Yeah, it sounds it sounds like it. So now you got the uh, the EP out. Satan's Cats, Bush Johnson and, uh, and Satan's Rats uh, together. It's just an EP at this point. Would there, I mean, are you guys talking about maybe doing a full album at some point, or is it just, uh, or is this just a, a one-off thing for you guys? Well, if the CD does as well, you know, we get some money back and we <laughs> sell our copies, you know, then we can finance uh, the recording for some more tracks and, and maybe put out a vinyl album that's what you know that's that's probably the, the most positive thing that we can think of doing and if we did that then of course we might rehearse up a, a set yep. and we might do some things it's all might or maybe at the moment you uh all all of you guys between you know ali uh ali harrison and uh and and uh dave sparrow you've all done done things over the years you were just saying that that you're now a guitar teacher do do your students have any understanding of of your your history and your and your background? Do they do they do they know what they're getting into when uh, when Steve Eagles winds up taking them on as a student? No, I don't think they do. <laughs> <laughs> but I had a, a good couple of teenage kids that was, I've been teaching, you know, and I gave them a copy. They're brother and sister, uh, and they they absolutely loved it. You know, they thought it was really cool. And, they're not. You know, they're not wrong. They're not. It, 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 wouldn't it be funny if you found out they were like Bob Geldof's grandkids? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I might have had a word to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go send this here. The, take this copy to your grandfather. See what he has to say about it. <laughs> yeah, well, you know Morrissey from the Smiths. I mean, he reviewed one of our singles. And how and how well did that go? Oh, he, he trashed it. <laughs> but he doesn't like anything. So I mean, that's actually <laughs> that's actually a sign. <laughs> Of approval, you know, if, if you can get him to hate something, that's actually good. <laughs> <laughs> and on the other hand, everyone hears that and says, "Yeah, okay, but it's Morrissey," you know. So <laughs> give him, give him the, the credit where it's due. The uh, the EP is an absolute blast to listen to. Uh, and again, it's you know, all of you know five songs, four of which uh, were done by the original Satan's Rats and uh, the Rocker from from Thin Lizzy. 
Uh, Steve, it's great to great to talk to you. I wish you all the best of luck with the uh, with the uh, the EP. It is a lot of fun. So thank you so much for for joining me today. Thank you, Bax. Take care. All right. Cheers, man. Bye bye. The name of the new EP is Satan's Cats by Puss Johnson and Satan's Rats, available on Salamander Records. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, feel free to like it, share it, review it, tell all your friends about it. You can email me at Bax at rock102.com. I'd love to know what you think. And thanks again for listening to Baxi's Musical Podcast.